Joining us on this Multiple Sclerosis Special Report is researcher Dr. Ellen Tremlett, who's an associate professor from the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you for having me on. Now, multiple sclerosis seems to be one of those diseases that can occur at an early stage in one's life. There also seems to be a prevalence in women. So if you could, for the benefit of our audience, what is multiple sclerosis and why does it occur at an early stage in one's life and why that particular prevalence in women? No, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So I guess it's uh, best to describe it as it's a, brain, it's a disease of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, in British Columbia, the average age at onset of MS is, is 30, uh, 30 years. Um, but there's a huge range. Unfortunately, we've even got young, young kids who can develop multiple sclerosis through to, to elderly people. But the average age is 30 and three quarters of the people uh, affected are women. So we think about one in 500, one in 1,000 people um, over their lifetime will develop multiple sclerosis. So there are a lot of people living with MS, about 75,000 in, in Canada. My group's looking at a, a number of different questions, um, ranging from whether the drugs we currently have for MS, if they're effective and, and what their adverse effects are, through to pregnancy outcomes in people with MS, because it does tend to affect women more, more often, um, risk of cancer in MS. So we are looking at a huge, huge number of questions. British Columbia is a fabulous place to do research because it's excellent um, access to data and information. So we do huge population-based studies. Now, there are some concerns about multiple sclerosis, whether or not it is, in fact, a neurological disease because of just the way some of its symptoms can mirror other medical conditions like Lyme disease. There are also some other concerns, the fact that there are some people who are talking about their MS being cured. Now, are these people wrong, or is there a possibility that the disease is being misdiagnosed or overdiagnosed to some extent? Now, I guess I'll start at the beginning. I think there's no doubt it's a neurological condition. It does affect the brain and the spinal cord, and when you, when you look at imaging, you can see damage occurring there. But that said, it's a very difficult disease to diagnose. Um, um, you have to exclude any other diseases which can actually mimic MS. There are many symptoms associated with multiple sclerosis which are similar to other conditions. You brought up Lyme's disease and there's a lot of similarity between um, the symptoms of Lyme disease and multiple sclerosis. So those other conditions do have to be excluded. Um, and and it, with respect to diagnosis, absolutely patients need to go to a, a specialist, the MS specialist neurologist, um, who is the best individual to, to diagnose MS, because it is a challenging disease to diagnose. Canada seems to be in one of the top highest rated countries affected by this disease. But what is also incredible about this disease in Canada is the fact that certain parts of our population, particularly the Inuit population, virtually have no incidence of this disease amongst them. Now, is research any closer to telling us why we're seeing these patterns, if it has something to do with their diet or just other environmental factors? And, and Canada's not unusual in that respect. Um, we do think that the risk of MS is, is um, tied partly to genetics and partly to environment. Um, so in terms of, say, the, the Inuit, there's a genetic component there that may somehow either protect them from getting MS or doesn't make them as susceptible. Diet may also um, factor in. We believe that um, low levels of vitamin D um, or the sunshine vitamin um, might be associated with an increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Um, and perhaps their diet is higher in, in, in fatty fish, which tends to be higher in vitamin D. Diet definitely um, um, holds a lot of interest for people. Unfortunately, there's, never, there's not particularly good evidence one way or the other to show that diet will benefic benefit um, MS over the long term. And more studies do need to be, be done. I think at the end of the day, whether you have MS or you don't, if you live a healthy lifestyle, I think you are going to feel better about yourself. And if you're in good physical condition, then um, I think that can potentially help you combat um, 
or deal with um, um, a condition such as MS, but there's no good evidence pointing at one particular thing other than, than vitamin D, but we still don't know whether vit giving someone vitamin D supplements will actually influence the disease over the long term, but studies are ongoing looking at that presently. But there are other areas like polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids that people have looked at, but again, there's just not the evidence either way that more studies need to be done what you guys call remyelination. Um, is research any closer to helping get to that point yet? Where exactly are we in terms of research? There are a number of groups that um, are looking to develop um, drugs that might promote remyelination, and that's really exciting. It's also difficult to actually measure whether remyelination has occurred or not. Um, and there are groups at, Uni uh, at UBC, University of British Columbia, who are actively um, looking at that, developing imaging tools that you can actually look at whether um, remyelination is occurring. So yeah, it's definitely an ongoing area, um, nothing concrete at the moment. Now, I must touch on the controversial nature of research, and I must ask you, certain critics out there talk about the fact that maybe research does not have an incentive to really find a cure or find cures to some of these diseases. The fact that every year, you know, billions of dollars are being accrued all in the name of finding cures for diseases. I mean, what would you say to those people who are just, you know, anti-research? I guess it couldn't be further from the truth. So I think to um, researchers are an incredibly dedicated group of people. Um, if you want to become wealthy, do not take a job up in research. It takes many, many years and a lot of research get into, researchers get into a lot of debt in order to get their degree, their master's, their PhD, their postdoc. Um, and they're incredibly driven to make a difference. And obviously a lot of researchers are in the field because they have family or loved ones with multiple sclerosis or whatever disease they're, they're looking at. So there's a huge incentive for them to um, make a difference. And absolutely, they are all desperately trying to find a cure as much as much as the next person or the person with MS. There's there's a lot of hope. There's a, there's a lot of interesting research going on at the moment. Um, but get out there and enjoy life. Um, Get involved with groups like the MS Society of Canada. Um, make sure you look after yourself and your health. And um, but there's a lot going on. Um, make sure you get in there and, and see your see your MS specialist neurologist. And someone who knows all too well about MS in the family is someone we all know quite well. He's a wide receiver for the BC Lions, a 2011 Grey Cup champion. But today, it is his family's struggles with multiple sclerosis since his mom's diagnosis that is putting a spotlight on this incredible athlete. It's Marco Iannuzzi. So as we said, multiple sclerosis is one of those diseases that's not just associated with old age. And you know something all right. about this because your mom was in fact diagnosed with this disease in her 20s as she prepared to have a baby. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a huge life-changing experience for her. If you could share some of her story, how sure. she came to be diagnosed. Yeah, it was, like you said, a very tough time. So um, it happened right after she gave birth to my youngest brother. Um, and uh, you can imagine she was taking care of myself and my older brother at the time. And she was actually, um, basically a biochemical reaction happened in her body where she was, uh, put into bed, bed rest, and she couldn't really control her legs anymore. She was losing her vision. Uh, it was a very scary time, uh, especially for my father, who was now in charge of, you know, being the ma major breadwinner of the family, as well as uh, taking care of two boys, and now he has to take care of his wife. It was a very difficult time. Um, but, uh, you know, after about, about a month of being bed rest, she was able to regain sort of, it went into remission, and she was able to regain control of her body, regain control of her, uh, her sight, and her vision came back. Um, and it was sort of a, a blessing, you know, it kind of disappeared, but we knew it was still there. And you were very young at the time oh. yourself. I mean, right. were you at the time aware just how serious the problem with her was? You know, I, I really wasn't aware of what exactly MS was um, until a lot later in my life. I, I mean, at that time, I was only three years old. Uh, one of my first memories of, of as a child was uh, we used to flood our backyard and make a little ice rink out of it. Well, the fun part actually was not only the ice rink, but when it would melt, we would play ball hockey. 
so I can remember every day checking to see if the ice is melted, checking to see. And uh, finally it melted, I went outside, played with my mom ball hockey, it was, it was my very first childhood memory. Fast forward a year, I was waiting for the snow to melt, waiting for the ice to melt, it finally melted, and I said, okay, let's go out and play again. And my mom said, well, she slowly made her way to the back door and she said, uh, I can't play with you today. And I was like, well, we had such a great time last year. Uh, you know, you let's do this again. Why. Yeah, I couldn't, exactly. and she said, well, sometimes, I'll never forget, she said two things that day. She said, sometimes your body uh, doesn't allow you to do the things you want it to do, so. She was very young herself at the time. Yeah. You know, I mean, for people who go through such a life-changing experience as this, you know, it takes quite a while to really wrap your head around it. Was it something she was able to come to terms with very quickly? Because she was in her 20s at the time. Yeah, um, I don't know if she came to terms to it, to terms with it right away immediately. Um, like I said, I was young, so my memory of just her not able to participate in the things that we had previously done, that's all I knew. Um, the first time I really learned more about what MS was and sort of the realization of our family was when they sent the home nurse um, to start uh, teaching my mom how to do her own injections for her medication every day. And at that time, the, the nurse sort of explained what it was, and I can still remember sitting around the kitchen table, and um, yeah, as I think about it, it sort of chokes me up. But, um, yeah, it's yeah, it was very tough. Absolutely. It was very tough, you know, understanding that uh, I loved sports and I loved running around and knowing that my mom wouldn't be able to do those things. So. Yeah, the beautiful thing about it is, is that you are a very keen advocate when it comes to lending your support to charities. Right. In fact, you are a very busy guy. I think we all know that. Now, a few years ago, you held a charity event in trying to raise some money for, I believe it was Branch Out, our neurological foundation. Correct. Um, what was that all about and why that particular foundation and why is it so important for you to lend your support in the way yeah. that you do? Um, so on that day, I want to go back to the story because this is the second thing my mom said to me is even though I can't do the things that I used to be able to do, I love watching you play. And so every time I got on the field where there was a track, a football field, a basketball court, I was always playing for my mom because she was watching me play. Um, and she was my inspiration, still is, and she actually still comes out to our games here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, going back to getting involved with the branch out, I, when we won the Grey Cup, we were all given uh, your day with the Cup, do whatever you like. And I decided, well, I should do something more than just enjoy it with myself and my family and friends. I want to, you know, bring a better, you know, maybe help other people beyond that and, and gain some awareness of, of MS or, or uh, some other philanthropic cause. Uh, the Branch Out Neurological Foundation came to me and I learned of their CEO who was a uh, an Olympic speed skater and she had MS and she was no longer able to compete anymore. Well, she overcame a lot of her um, fatigue and a lot of her numbness through a homeopathic remedies of, of changing her diet um, and, and doing a whole bunch of different things as far as uh, eating gluten free, lactose free and, exactly. and that's when it... Lifestyle change. Okay. Lifestyle change Very and that opened so. my eyes and Very I said, well, so. you know, when, when I remember the, the home nurse coming to our house, she never really mentioned those sorts of things. It was all about the medication. Yeah. And now seeing that there was a new path and a new light and maybe a new chance at um, regaining some of her motor function, I said, well, let's figure this out. So I, I decided to support the Branch Out Neurological Foundation. We did the climb for the cup. We raced up uh, all 802 steps of the Calgary Tower with the cup. Um, we, we let the public and corporate sponsors, and we raised, I think, just over $20,000 that day. Wow, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, so it was, uh, like I said, it was a learning experience for me to understand what homeopathic remedies existed for MS, um, and also to help out a great cause that, that we really was close to me. Now, no doubt that, you know, you've really been through quite a bit, you know, with your mom with this, and mm. you, you mentioned the Grey Cup. The yeah. beautiful things that you've not let any of this uh, hold you back in any way. You've actually gone on to succeed in your career. Um, mm. You before, now we know you're a wide receiver for the BC Lions right now, but before that you went to Ivy League, Harvard University. Right. And when you got there, you wanted to study particular disciplines in a particular way. Right. When you realized it wasn't available, you decided to be one of 10 to successfully petition the creation of a new multi-focus degree, yeah. which saw you attend MIT and Harvard at the same time. I mean, right. talk about smarty pants. How, how <laughs> incredible is that for you? And why was it so important for you to study the, those disciplines in that manner? So I get, um, my inspiration started, I always wanted to be a doctor to try and help cure MS. And so I got to Harvard and I started studying uh, the pre-med requirements, a lot of sciences, and then economics as well. I thought I'll just get a side degree of economics just to keep me interested in other aspects of school. Um, about halfway through my college degree, uh, I 
successfully launched um, a financial group and we were trading currency trade. And it was so successful that I said, you know, it doesn't really make sense to continue on with this economics degree. Uh, I started to realize that all the science I had behind me could be used for something else. And then I said, well, how about architecture? I remember growing up, my father would bring home um, blueprints. Mm -hmm. And he was an estimator, and he'd estimate the cost. And I said, well, who's drawing these blueprints for you? And he said, well, that's an architect. I said, well, I want to be an architect. Mm -hmm. I can remember that. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll open up this sort of uh, plan B type thing and, and maybe take all these sciences, put it into architecture, environmental science, uh, and then it'll still leave the door open for medicine, leave the door open to be an architect, leave the door to be uh, a wealth manager, anything. So, um, yeah, so then I had to launch that degree, which, uh, you know, they didn't offer a lot of the architecture courses at Harvard. So I cross-registered at MIT. And uh, I, I was really a big pain in the butt for admissions because I guess they had to do a lot of paperwork on my behalf. Well, that's right, because it was the first time ever in yeah. Harvard's history that that had ever been done. You know, right. With, so how do you think that experience has come to benefit you in your professional career? I think that those four years were very difficult four years um, as far as time management organization goes. Um, my wife and I, we got married in our second year of college. Uh, we had our first child in the third year. So we were very busy. And when I think of anything that I'm um, faced with today, yeah. it's a piece of cake. Because when I look back, what we did during that time, you know, playing NCAA football, uh, raising, getting married, raising our first daughter, going to MIT and Harvard at the same time, creating a degree, which took a lot of work on the side. You know, it was, I pushed myself to the absolute limit. So nowadays when, uh, you know, I'm faced with a, a juggling act of, you know, I, I work uh, as a wealth manager as well as play with the BC Lions and I do a lot of philanthropy, I, I just look back and whenever things get really hectic, I look back and say, well, I've done this in the past and I can do it again today. Your coach has been quoted as describing you as uh, an instinctual player, somebody who's well aware of his environment and who hmm. acts accordingly to that. Um, tell me about the discipline that drives you to continue to want to be the successful player and person that you are today. I think that's exactly what drives me. It is success that drives me. Um, no matter what I'm doing, if I'm playing professional football or if I was even playing flag football on a weekend with friends, I, I want to win and I'm competitive. Um, I guess my dedication to whatever I do, I, need, I always want to be in the top percentile of whatever I'm doing, athletically, academically, uh, in business. I, I love to be at the top because uh, on your way to the top, you're coming across a lot of people who have, have come, uh, overcome a lot of obstacles to get there and you're learning from them and, and you're surrounding yourself by the top percentile in whatever uh, faculty or area of study that you're looking at. So. That's where my discipline comes from. It's just the journey of success. So tell us how your mom's doing today, because there's no doubt we all yeah. know that there's no cure for MS. Right. So how is she doing today? You know, my mom is, it's almost as if she doesn't have MS as far as mental state. She is uh, very disabled by her fatigue and, and her walking ability and some of her vision. But she zips around the house as if nothing's wrong. She's cleaning the house. She's working as an accountant from the home. Um, you know, she'll, she's never, ever changed our plans or our lifestyle of, as a family um, based upon her MS. And she's just always like, OK, let's do it. We, she, I guess the whole journey to success for me is just from her is that, yeah, I just see that, you know, there's nothing that ever she's ever said no to or said didn't try to attempt. And um, like I said, it's her. She's digressing as far as her physical ability and such, but her mental state is, is sharper than ever. And and she still continues to be an inspiration for our whole family. And she's never complained once. If you had, you know, because there are a lot of people who are watching you right now, families who are probably going through the exact same thing. Yeah. If you had an advice for them in terms of how hopeful they can be and how it is okay and it will be, what would you say to them? You know, I thought about this and I've been asked it a few times and I think it, the key thing is just to go on and live your life. I mean, you're going to have new obstacles that you might not have otherwise had. But, you know, my mother still comes out to all these games. It's difficult for her to get into the crowd and walk up the steps and get to the seat. but. It would be a lot easier for her to stay at home, but she still goes out and gets to the games, and, and she lives her life. And I think that it hasn't stopped her from work. It hasn't stopped her from enjoying her grandchildren now. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's going to continue to digress until we find a, a cure. Um, and I think we are going to find a cure soon. So keep your fingers crossed for the cure, um, but live your life in the meantime. 
you know, it's a beautiful thing. There are a lot of kids out there who are watching you guys, you know, who want to be like you, you athletes. And, you know, and there's no doubt about it that, you know, I think for some of those kids, they, they, they're not, they, they don't know that, you know, it takes more than just the, you know, um, sports training, if you want to call it that, that it really takes a combination of both that and really successful academics yeah. in order to be that well-rounded, well you know, athlete. So if you had an advice for these kids watching you right now, what would you say to them in terms of not just, you know, yeah. being, you know, great athletes, but being, you know, incredible people in life and being successful at that? Um, I would say to, to look up what a geodesic dome is, okay? Now this sounds really crazy and you're gonna go, oh, look at this nerd, he knows some weird word. Geodesic dome, it's got a whole bunch of sides on it, right? You gotta make yourself have multi-side, multi-dimensions, many sides, yes. And uh, you know, whatever you're doing, you're gonna fail, you're gonna, you're gonna come across obstacles, there's gonna be defeat. But if you have more sides to your geodesic dome, you can sometimes lean on other parts uh, when things are tough and, and just always continue to develop. I mean, it took me three years to get into Harvard and that's a whole other uh, story that we can get into at another time. But uh, lots of people told me no along that way. and. Uh, the more people told me no, I learned why they were saying no and, and what I wasn't good enough uh, or why I wasn't good enough and, and I bettered those areas. And, and by doing so, I just created more dimension to who I was. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, just continue to uh, build up your, your resume and that, I don't mean on paper and where you worked, but I mean your resume of your, your toolbox of Character. life. Exactly. Absolutely. Intangibles. Love it. It's a beautiful thing. Mark Ionuzzi. You, your story has been really inspiring and thank you so much for sharing your story and I continue to wish your mom the very best and thank you. continue to keep her in my prayers. Marco Ionews everyone and for those who are watching who have a problem with MS, contact the MS Society of Canada. They have a lot of resources for patients and families. Well, it, that's it for me here at BC Play Stadium with the BC Lions from right here. I'm Lola Kala. Marco Ionuzzi. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.